morning. Good morning. Thank you. It's so good to be back together. I'm going to continue to encourage you to, you know, holler out. Uh, let's shift that culture a tiny bit with us because it's just, I mean, once you've been apart for two years, ah, oh, it's so good to be together. And good morning to all of you there in Zoom land as well. I am the Reverend Dana Warsnop, minister of this congregation. So happy to be the minister serving this congregation. I greet the good people here in the sanctuary and all of you out there on Zoom and on YouTube. Welcome. I welcome you all into a place of strength and comfort in a world that is once again a swirl. May we find here kindness and courage in this widening circle, widening circle, deepening circle, deepening a fierce love of all people and our, including our own children, our own country and people who are in lands afar a deepening, a widening circle, a deepening fierce love, a demanding love of democracy and peace. And as the people of Ukraine are fiercely defending their own land, let us also let us remember the depth of human attachment to the lands that gave them birth, acknowledging that the lands of this nation are also the ancestral home of indigenous peoples. In Ventura, this is the Chumash people. So a few announcements. It is chilly here because we've got windows open and fans blowing which will feel like such a blessing in a few months. We do have uh, shawls for chilly shoulders back there, and if you are feeling chilly, just go on up and get one. Uh, also, do want to remind people that there is a Wellspring group forming. Uh, this is a program that deepens our spiritual connection, and in this case, it is deepening our spiritual connection to racial justice, through a deep dive into the UUA uh, bylaws, which I know sounds not as exciting as some things can sound. And wow, it's great. There are still some spots available in it. You'll find information, UUCV this week, and there may be another something coming out soon, more information coming out about that. Also, we do still have a memory box for uh, Memories of Joe Hutchins. It's back over on the round table in the corner over here, just to share some memories of our dear friend Joe, who we lost suddenly. And um, our crafters are gonna put something together for his family. Um, and thank you. Let us arrive fully together from wherever you are this morning. Let us find together beauty, community, peace, and resolve. And with all of that, let us enter sacred space. I am Worship Associate Zena Kingshill. We invite those who are Zooming or streaming into this service to light a chalice or candle at home as Reverend Dana lights the chalice of our free faith here in the sanctuary.
We begin our service this morning with these words from the first letter to the Philippians in the Christian scripture. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. I'm Carolyn Vierke, the music director, and I'd like to welcome you all and invite you to join me in singing Come, Come, Whoever You Are. The words will be on the screen, and if you are at home or here in the sanctuary, please rise if you're willing and able. My name is Fidelity Balmer, and I'm the Director of Religious Education for our congregation. And if I made it to the chancel today, it means I must have survived the ropes course adventure we did with our youth group yesterday. So even though we were 15 to 20 feet in the air with a huge harness on, pulling on and taking off something called a, a trolley, I want to say, that you use to zip line, yes, we made it, everyone survived. So yesterday's ropes course adventure was the beginning of our coming of age launch here at UUCV. This is a program for our seventh through ninth graders to truly explore what they believe. We have so much planned for them, what we have affectionately named theology parties, yes, where they'll explore their UU values, matching with a mentor to reflect on Sunday services, wonder and awe nature adventures, the list goes on. So what is coming of age? What does it mean to come of age in a UU congregation? The way I explained it to the youth and their parents was that this means that this congregation and Unitarian Universalism as a whole is no longer just their parents' congregation or something their family does and they tag along on Sundays and kind of hang out. But this means that it's their church too. This is their faith tradition. This is something they can take on as their own. At 13 or 14 years old, it's really time to consider, do I want to align myself with the values of Unitarian Universalism? Coming of age is a UU youth with those rights, responsibilities, privileges, and a lot of excitement. And yet, in our Unitarian Universalist religious education world, we do have a strange and almost tentative attachment to our young people because part of our theology and philosophy of RE is a deep acceptance of the very notion that our children and youth might choose not to stay. As a free faith tradition, we truly give them free reign throughout the entirety of their RE education to explore other faith traditions and consider if this is truly where they want to be. So we know that the youth who stay have decided that this is, this is the place for them. When we visited Temple Beth Torah with Rabbi Lisa, she said to us when we explained this theology and philosophy, wow, that's like the exact opposite of indoctrination. 
And I agree, it really is. It was a really cool thing to hear from her. Our middle school group of sixth through eighth graders, led by Carrie Davis, Cappy Paulson, Diana Kubelos, and Gary Zinnick, has had a really amazing time exploring faith traditions like Christianity, Judaism, last month, paganism. We have one very precocious middle schooler who provides us with a full accounting of how UUCV can improve based on what they saw at other faith communities every time. So first up, we most definitely are going to need to put in stained glass windows pronto. So I don't know which one of you is doing that, but we're in. And our coming of age program follows this same philosophy. We might need to rename our youth program coming of age. If you want to, you don't have to. We love you. We hope you stay. If you don't, we'll be sad. But we will try to show you why this thing is really cool. Though that title might be a little too long. And yet I'm finding that sometimes we find that when we let go and truly let our young people follow their own journey and set their own course, the story might come back around in an interesting way. Carrie Davis shared a quote with me this morning from Harry Potter, Luna Lovegood. I'm not going to get it perfectly, but she says, you might find that the things that you have let go of and the grief and sorrow you have around them, those things will loop back into your life in a new way and not the way that you expect it, right? And this is um, part of my own story and my own coming of age. So many do not know that I actually came to UUCV as a middle schooler for a few months in seventh grade. I had a blast going to Camp DeBeneville Pines I loved the youth group game nights, and I was desperate for community and lonely as a seventh grader. Yet my family and my own heart, we were still finding our way after some deep wounds caused from the church of our early childhood and the church of my parents' young adulthood. So we did not end up finding a home here at UUCV at that time. And yet, when I went off to college, inexplicably, and I still don't quite understand it, one of the very first things I did when I got there was reach out to the Unitarian Universalist Church. I found out that all I had to do was roll out of bed in my freshman dorm, Keeney Quadrangle, and walk literally 100 feet down the street to First Unitarian Providence, which was on the exact same street as my freshman dorm the First Providence Church on Benevolent Street, right? I love it. <laughs> so something about UUCV, something about this community, something about what it provides had stuck in my head. And when I was desperate in college, again, for community and kinship, I knew exactly where to look, and it provided. So from that scared seventh grader all the way to my scared 18-year-old self, both times in a new place, Unitarian Universalism had waited for me to be ready for it. A coming of age that was really, truly patient. <laughs> so to our young people and to our adults as well, I invite you to consider your own coming of age story this morning. And it doesn't have to be from seventh grade or ninth grade or as a youth. It can start today. Maybe it started years ago, or maybe you're still on that journey. I'm coming to believe that we are all constantly in a process of growing into community, growing into what it means to be a part of this covenant, of this congregation. It's a journey that never ends, and it's a journey that we are ready to join you on whether or not you are a seventh through ninth grader starting our program, or you've been here 25 plus years. Thank you. Good morning. I appreciate this opportunity to share my Unitarian story. I've been a Unitarian Universalist and a member of this church for over half my life. I cannot imagine my life without this beloved Unitarian Universalist community. It has been my spiritual home, my supportive anchor, and sustained me through life's many ups and downs over these many, many years. I hope I have given back as much with my time, talent, and commitment. 
I was raised in the, unit, in the Jewish faith and traditions. I still enjoy Jewish holidays and, of course, Jewish foods. <clears throat> I heard about the Unitarian Universalist Church from a friend who also went to the Ventura Jewish Temple. Since I had recently moved to the San Fernando Valley, I only was up in Ventura for a job uh, on weekends and to visit friends. I went to various church events, potlucks, and get-togethers. I met a really nice guy named Mike Pizzuto. I guess the church introduced me to my future husband. Five years later, Mike and I moved back to Ventura and joined the church, his third time as a member. As the rabbi who married us said, you're Jewish, he's Unitarian, so you can be Unitarians. I felt a great connection to our church and our Unitarian principles. There is also a strong social concern action group, and that was very important to me. In the Jewish faith, I was taught it is a blessing to help others. I remember our church on the hill very well. It was like a family since we were a very small group. We made very close friendships that we still have today. I have been with this church through various ministers, milestones, and difficult times. Our church has been a diverse, eclectic mix of views and spirituality that I have learned to love. This church has helped me grow into the person I am today. This Unitarian faith in our church has enriched and deepened my life. I have learned how to be more compassionate, more generous, and more confident in my values. The world needs us to be here and speak up. I also have a very special place in my heart for Camp de Beneville. It has been an inspiring and healing place for myself and my family and given us a larger Unitarian relationship. I have de developed strong, deeper bonds with the women in our church through women's groups, goddess classes, and our previously annual women's retreat. I have amazing and long-lasting memories and experiences of all of those things for many years. My spiritual practice has been in my work in the church in various ways. I have found it in religious education as a teacher and on the committee, as a worship associate and a pastoral associate. I have found my spirit and faith in social action, like helping with our community homeless or action for voting and immigration rights. I have given back in my time and treasure to support this incredible, loving church. I will always value and be committed to the Unitarian Universalist beloved community and our principles. We can help to change the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rena. Each Sunday, this congregation gives away our collection to an organization in the larger an organization in the larger community or to funds that help people. Oh, hello. Or we give away our collection to an organization in the larger community or to funds that help people in our own church. Those at home, or wherever you are, zooming in, streaming in, uh, you have two ways to give. There is a link posted in the Zoom chat, or you can text from your phone at the number also on the screen, 844-901-1779. Folks who are here can text to give, or you could still write a check or give cash and drop it off at the basket at the back of the sanctuary after the service. Our offering today goes to Camp de Beneville Pines, which two people have already mentioned here. It's, it's, it's a significant spiritual home for many. Jim Merrill shares a story of his family's time at camp. He writes, our first trip to Camp de Beneville Pines was a disaster gone wonderfully right. We had driven our daughters up to elementary winter camp, 
and had taken a clue from friends to shorten the round trip by booking a cabin in the charming nearby village of Angeles Oaks for, the, for their weekend. We drove into a snowy campground and unloaded the girls at their cabin. And then the car would not stop when we wanted to leave. It was just too cold for our old Sentra. So we trudged down to Omey Lodge and explained our dilemma to Janet James, camp director. She let us use the camp phone to cancel our reservation and said we could stay in an unoccupied cabin as long as we didn't turn off, turn on the heat. This generous, adaptive, warm, and accepting first experience is what camp has continued to mean to our family. It's where our daughters made lifelong friends. It's where a member of our family felt the encouragement and embrace to speak freely of her identity. The lifelong friends, some of them are still meeting annually at the young adult camp. The Beneville Pines is a place, a UUA covenanting community where people, and especially young people from all over the Pacific Southwest, can come together and be supported in their Unitarian Universalist values when that acceptance may not be available in their hometowns. Following two fires and a pandemic closure, camp really needs our help. Camp de Beneville Pines is our church away from church and there are trees. Thank you for giving generously as you always do. And I just want to note that our offertory this morning is sung by a Ukrainian children's choir in more peaceful times just two or three years ago.
are grateful ever and always for the generosity of this congregation, which weaves a tapestry of love we call community here and across the world. May we hold in this tapestry so tenderly all the people of Ukraine as well. Thank you. That song got to me. I use my mask to dab my eyes. And I stand with Ukraine. I tried to wear their colors today. <laughs> Part of staying connected within our community is sharing with one another the great joys and sorrows that grace our lives. We place stones in water for both the celebrations and sorrows in our hearts. The ripples that go out represent the way that something that touches the heart of one of us travels throughout the community to touch all of us. I invite you now to speak into the gathered community or write into the Zoom chat the names of those you wish to celebrate or memorialize or those in need of the loving embrace of this beloved community. Please feel free to continue to add to the chat even after the silent pause has ended. Reverend Dana will now place one final stone in the water for all the joys and sorrows yet unspoken in the silent sanctuary of our hearts. May we be truly grateful for all that is our life. Please remain seated and join me in singing hymn 159, This Is My Song. We offer a reading in two voices this morning. It Matters What We Believe by radical 20th century religious educator, 
Sophia Lyon Foss. Some beliefs are like walled gardens. They encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged. Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies. Some beliefs are like shadows, clouding children's days with fears of unknown calamities. Other beliefs are like sunshine, blessing children with the warmth of happiness. Some beliefs are divisive, separating the saved from the unsaved, friends from enemies. Other beliefs are bonds in a world community where sincere differences beautify the pattern. Some beliefs are like blinders shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. Other beliefs are like gateways opening wide vistas for exploration. Some beliefs weaken a person's selfhood. They blight the growth of resources. Other beliefs nurture self-confidence and enrich the feeling of personal worth. Some beliefs are rigid, like the body of death, impotent in changing, impotent in a changing world. Other beliefs are pliable, like the young sapling ever growing with the upward thrust of life. I invite you now into a time of stillness and meditation. Breathe. Arrive. Breathe. What is it you believe? How do you live into what you believe? A silent meditation. Thank you. 
I need to give credit where it is due. Those are the words of Theodore Parker, who you'll hear again in a little bit. But also the tune to that song was composed by Carolyn Bjerke. So I too survived the ropes course yesterday afternoon, along with David Henkel, uh, who is a youth advisor, and, and Fidelity Balmer, our director of religious education. And together, we navigated 12 aerial obstacles and six zip lines. And it was, Fidelity told us all afterward, a metaphor for the journey our coming of age youth are about to undertake. A journey in which sometimes they will feel like they are all alone, balancing in midair, or, and, 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 and at other times it will be a team effort when they can offer and receive gentle words of confidence and support. As they prepare for their journey, I would like to tell them and all of you a story of my own spiritual journey at their age. I was 13 when I marched down the stairs of our home with a serious announcement for my mother. With all the gravitas I could muster I told her that I was now as mature as I was ever going to be. My mother laughed, as you just did, and said she certainly hoped not. Now, now I now I do get her response, and I am quite happy that I did keep growing up learning and maturing, yet at the time, I felt misunderstood and hurt. I didn't have quite the right words at the time for a profound insight that is still true for me. For in very real ways, I am still the same person I was at 13. I still hold a sense of selfhood, values, and purpose in life that was with me, that I came to understand that day. And there is a reason that so many religious traditions hold a rite of passage for their youth at about age 13 or 14. Because by that age, and I'm speaking to our youth here, through Zoom or a recording, you have reached a place when who you are is arising in you more and more surely. And we want to honor and encourage that as you continue on. I look back at my sweet, passionate, 13-year-old self and feel a clear and direct kinship with her. And so it goes that that very same year, I marched down those very same stairs one Sunday morning and told my father that I absolutely refused to go to church with him. This led to an 
epic battle of wills that woke the whole house. My dad was ultimately a very fair man, and he could not deny the righteousness of, uh, of my cause. My older brothers no longer went to church, and I was old enough to start thinking for myself. He didn't go to church really very often or regularly, so my attendance in Sunday school was so erratic that nothing there ever made sense. To his dying day, my father could not quite fully believe that in this battle of wills, I won. Now, to our children and youth, no, I am not advocating here that you should simply be left off the hook when you don't want to go to church. Not at all. Rather, I do think our religious education program should teach you about how to live in the world. It should be a place where you can ask great big questions, have fun, be with friends, where you know you are worthy and loved and you may take in beliefs that are pliable, growing and expansive, that we encourage you to follow them, follow those paths wherever they take you, even if it is beyond us and our tradition. Back in those days, my younger years, I had n utterly no idea why my father went to church or why he made me go. It made no sense to me. Yet I learned later that there at that church in the late 60s and early 70s, that the, from the pulpit of, this, of his staid, sober Presbyterian church, the minister used to work the civil rights movement into every single sermon he preached. Now, this was, we lived in a very affluent and very white suburb of Detroit, Michigan. My father apparently just loved the tweaking that Reverend Walsh gave his fellow suburbanites. And knowing this now makes me love and respect my father all the more. Though at the time, I did think he was just being mean. And the layers of irony just keep coming. For my sister Pamela still had to go to church. She is six years younger than I am. And then one day, she came home from Sunday school and repeated the racist joke that the teacher had told in class. And she never went back again. I guess that Reverend Walsh knew what his congregation needed. I hope he knew that he reached some people, that he reached my father. So. I did stop going to church at age 13, and yet I never stopped searching. Some 20 years later, I encountered Buddhism and started a meditation practice, and that opened doors and windows that I had not known were shut. The Buddha really did say, don't take my word for it. Believe nothing, no matter where you read it or who said it, no matter if I have said it, unless, unless, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. Here was ancient wisdom that felt so radical, fresh and new in such a dogmatic religious culture. I realized that what I had been seeking all along was spiritual connection. And yet I longed for community, and so I soon found my way to a Unitarian Universalist church. 
And on that very first Sunday, the minister spoke of Jesus and the Buddha on completely equal terms, and I knew I had found a spiritual home. We offer many sources of wisdom. We draw from many sources of wisdom, and we walk many paths to truth. I could follow the path that made sense to me, even as I knew it was not the only path. I could follow the Buddha and hear the wisdom of Paul from Christianity. Paul, who encouraged his followers in Philippia, in Philippa, to prove all things and hold fast to what is good. This is exactly what we will be asking of our youth in coming of age, that they explore many spiritual paths, figure out, figure out what makes sense. Think about it some more. Hang on to what grabs hold and keep on going. Our tradition does arise, in, arise into the world from seven principles, likely soon to be eight. And yet we draw nourishment and inspiration from six sources, which offer many paths for our spiritual lives. Our first source is direct experience of transcending mystery and wonder, which moves us to an openness to the forces that create and uphold life. That's the one that still speaks to my 13-year-old self who knew her own mind. Yet that is really just a starting place. From there, we can follow many paths that well up as the sources of our faith. Our second source reads, words and deeds of prophetic people which challenge us, which challenge us to confront structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. This is, a one, this is one about the people who light our way for us. More Bookmark that one. There's going to be more later. We also draw from the wisdom of the world's religions, which inspire us in our ethical and spiritual life. We honor the taproot of, our, of Jewish and Christian teachings, which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Still another stream embraces humanist teachings which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science. And our final source affirms our deepening religious understanding of our connection to earth and all of creation, embracing earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. Many sources, many paths. We invite our dear youth to explore these sources and find their own ways, their own paths. And so now I switch gears a bit to tell you a recent direct experience with two prophetic women who are currently confronting powers and structures of evil. Both trained as historians seemed actually surprised to find themselves with such prominent voices followed and looked up to by so many people. Last Tuesday, I got to hear a talk by Fiona Hill and Heather Cox Richardson. Fiona Hill is a historian of Russia and Eastern Europe who served on the National Security Council and testified in Do Donald Trump's first impeachment. Her clear, 
direct and fierce voice resonated with many as she came forward to defend democracy. Heather Cox Richardson is a professor of American history who writes letters from an American every single night. She brings a clarity of historical perspective to the daily news, cutting through the blaring headlines and the pontification of the pundits. She is a light that shines out in a storm, making such deep sense. I read her every day and literally save every one of her posts. Now, last Tuesday, because, because things were really heating up in, Euro, in, Euro, in Ukraine, we were all wrapped by the depth of Fiona's perspectives, understanding, and experience. And even Heather used much of her time to ask Fiona more questions. The situation in Ukraine is frightening and complicated and still so uncertain. There is talk of peace talks and also of nuclear weapons being put on alert. And here we are, thousands of miles away. Yet both these women gave me hope that night that has lasted. They both, I absolutely, absolutely know what they are talking about, and they speak their minds. Yet what also struck me is how surprised they really are and the kind of attention, even adulation, they are getting. Fiona spoke of how odd it feels that people are selling semi-religious votive candles with her image on them. And here she is, Saint Fiona. Not even semi-religious, actually. So powerful. Not that we should worship her or ask her to somehow for intercession in, in our lives, but she is a powerful light of hope. She is a prophetic woman confronting powers and structures of evil who can inspire us to do the same. When the talk was done, I then had a chance to tell Heather how much her work meant to me. <laughs> I had to break into a more serious discussion, something that was going on, and I said, sorry, sorry, I just really need a fangirl moment. Blessedly, Heather smiled. I told her that she has been keeping my head on straight through all the swirling mess. She sounded as surprised as Fiona with this kind of adulation, and I was standing below her as she was still on the stage. This photo, she invited me up with her for that photo. So oh, she said, you know, people keep saying that, 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 I'm so, that my words are so important, but I'm just writing to try to figure it all out for myself. As a working historian, she didn't really expect to have a powerful voice in a time when our democracy is under such serious threat. A powerful voice that is making a difference. For one of the gifts of democracy is that sometimes such voices can and do get amplified and they make a difference. And so, I want to leave you with a final image. Heather posts every single day, yet she takes a break sometimes, writing a quick note along with a photograph by her husband, Buddy Poland. Here's one example. 
She reminds us to breathe and that beauty surrounds us. Even when war threatens to expand. So Buddy was there that night, standing back, just watching all of, watching Heather and all of her adoring fans. And so after my fangirl moment, while others were having theirs, I snuck around back and I thanked him too. I thanked him for keeping my head on straight with such beauty. Our world situation is complex. As for Ukraine right now, there is little we can do but pay attention and work to defend democracy at home. Do our work of justice in our own congregation, our own communities, and our own country. For what both Fiona and Heather said is that Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Putin is not really afraid of Ukraine or of NATO. What he is afraid of is democracy. And our deepest work is in our own home where our democracy is being threatened and undermined. And one more thing we can also do. We can raise up strong and thoughtful children, raise them up into committed and thoughtful and kind adults who can speak their own truth when it is called upon, when it is needed. That, too, is our work in the face of injustice, in the face of the powers and structures of evil who would undermine what good our country has managed to accomplish through democratic means. That, is, that too, is our work in the face of injustice. Amen. And may it be so. Please join me in prayer. Holy beingness of many names and no name, voice of power and compassion, spirit of life which dwells within and among and beyond us this day and always, May we keep our hearts open even as there is so much that breaks our hearts. May we let them break open. May we remember Trayvon Martin who was killed as a 17-year-old just 10 years ago. May we remember and support the children and parents in Texas, children who simply want to be themselves and parents who want to support them. And may we support, rise in solidarity with the people of Ukraine, holding them tenderly, holding their children as tenderly as we hold our own, knowing that all lands have sunlight and clover and true hearts. May we rise in solidarity. And may all those who are ill, 
find healing. May those who are in despair find hope. May those who are without shelter find home. And may all those suffering in conflict and war throughout the world, and especially in Ukraine, may they, may we find peace. Amen. And blessed be. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in our closing hymn, number 1008, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, when we trust the wisdom in Extinguish the chalices, um, and and the, um, and then for the benediction. Please join me in reading the words on the screen as we prepare to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish, extinguish this, this flame, time, but, but not the light, light of truth, truth the, the warmth, warmth of community, community or the fire, fire of commitment. commitment. Those we carry into our lives until we are together again. So, before the final words and postlude, I invite those on Zoom to get into breakout rooms for your own coffee hour. Those who are here, we will be having coffee once more out back. Uh, uh, and uh, that may be moving around, but we're going out back this time. And if you have cash or checks for Devenneville Pines, you can drop them in the basket at the back. May our hearts be in a holy place. This is what we seek for our youth, and it is what we hope to live into. All the gifts of being in a holy place. All the gifts of this living tradition. So I leave you with the words of 19th century transcendentalist radical abolitionist Unitarian minister Theodore Parker, which Carolyn sang early. Be ours a religion which like sunshine goes everywhere 
its temple, all space, its shrine, the good heart, its creed, all truth, its ritual works of love. Go forth in love. Go forth in peace. May the peace we carry forth flow out through all the world. May we all know peace. Amen. And may it be so.